Good morning, Philadelphia. Good morning, uh, colleagues, and good morning to the viewing public uh, who is here today for today's committee hearing. Um, we are now ready uh, to begin our ch Children and Youth Committee hearing, in which I am the chair of the Philadelphia Children and Youth Committee. I am City Council Member Anthony Phillips. I understand that state law currently requires that the that the following announcement be made at the beginning of every public hearing as follows. Due to current public health emergency, the city city council committees are currently meeting remotely. We are using Microsoft Teams to make these remote hearings possible. Instructions for how the public may view and offer public testimony at public hearings or council committees are included in the public hearing notice notices that are published in the Daily News, Inquirer, and Legal Intelligencer prior to the hearings and can be found on phlcouncil.com. I now note that the hour has come. Rachel, will you please call the roll to take attendance? Members that are in attendance will please indicate that you are present uh, when your name is called. Also, please say a few brief words when responding so that your image will be displayed on screen when you speak. Vice Chair Isaiah Thomas. Good afternoon, I'm present. Council Member Jamie Gautier. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and colleagues present. Council Member Kendra Brooks. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and colleagues, I am present. And Council Member Jim Harity. Uh, good evening, I'm present. Thank you, council members. A quorum of the committee is present and the hearing is now called to order. This is the public hearing of the Committee on Children and Youth on resolution number 230037. Rachel, will you please read the title of the resolution? 230037, a resolution authorizing the Committee on Children and Youth to conduct hearings to examine the state of Philadelphia's child welfare workforce. Great. Before we begin to hear testimony from the witnesses who we have for today, everyone who has been invited to the meeting to testify should be aware that this public hearing is being recorded. Because the hearing is public, participants and viewers have no reasonable expectation of privacy. By continuing to be in the meeting, you are consenting to being recorded. Additionally, prior to recognizing members for the questions or comments they have for witnesses, I will note for the record at this time that we will use the chat feature available in Microsoft Teams to allow members to signify that they wish to be recognized. In order to comply with the Sunshine Act, the chat feature must only be used for this purpose. Before I ask Rachel to call the first panel for resolution 230037, I would like to make an opening comment. When I was sworn in as a council person about three and a half months ago, I knew that children and youth was going to be one of my focus areas. My background is as an education leader, and I have worked with hundreds of teens, actually well over a thousand teens, to provide them with opportunities in leadership, college, and career at the high school. That is why I was excited to be named the chair of the City Council's Committee on Children and Youth. This is our first committee hearing with me serving as chair, and I'm delighted to be here today. As a bit of a background, this hearing came from a January meeting that I had with several members of the Philadelphia Child Welfare Workforce Tax Force. At this meeting, they shared with me their November 2022 report entitled The State of Philadelphia's Child Welfare Workforce, Findings and Recommendations. During our meeting, the members of the Philadelphia Child Welfare Workforce Task Force recounted to me challenges facing our child welfare providers, including the community umbrella agencies known as CUAs. Some of these challenges include low salaries, high caseloads, and workloads, a high turnover rate, poor professional development, secondary trauma, and burnout. 
One of the more alarming revelations, which I know will be testified about today, is that one of the agencies that operates four of city's CUAs, Turning Points for Children, will no longer participate in the program as of mid-2023 due to an exuberant increase in its, in its assurance premium from $70,000 to $10 million per year. The child welfare industry was built on solid foundations, but after decades of underfunding and due to workforce challenges exacerbated by COVID-19 pandemic, the foundations are cracking. We are at a point now where the system is, is so stressed that we are failing the very welfare of children and families that it was created to protect. Now, to be clear, I do not want this hearing to be a gotcha hearing. I'm very pleased that the Commissioner for the Department of Human Services is here today, and I want to state for the record that City Council wants to be a partner for DHS in addressing these problems. However, I do want to note that we are working together during this hearing because this is a very important for our children and our families, and that collaboration is going to be incredibly essential that we get the recommendations right so that we can have a better support for these families. With that said, do any of my colleagues have any comments they would like to make before the clerk calls on the first panel to testify? All right, seeing that none of my colleagues would like to make a comment at this moment, I would like to have Rachel call on the first panel for, test, for, for, for testimony. Thank you. Yes, the first panel is uh, just Commissioner Kimberly Ali. Good afternoon, City Council Chairman Phillips, Vice Chairman Thomas, and members of the Council's Committee on Children and Youth in Philadelphia. My name is Kimberly Ali, and I am the Commissioner of the City of Philadelphia Department of Human Services, known as DHS. With me today is Nadine Parisi, Chief Financial Officer, as well as other members of my team. Today, DHS has been asked to provide testimony on workforce-related aspects of Philadelphia's child welfare system. Before I proceed any further, let me thank DHS, the community umbrella agencies, and the provider staff for their dedication and commitment to the children, youth, and families of Philadelphia. Without them, DHS would not have experienced the following gains. 2,000 children and their families receiving services in their own home to stabilize them and prevent them from being separated. A 44% reduction in the placement of children from a high of 6,183 children in 2017 to a low of 3,468 children today and 52% of children being placed with their families or someone that they know to reduce the trauma that is caused by removing them from their homes. Despite these gains and the many more positive outcomes that the children, youth, and families have experienced, the turnover of frontline social workers as well as supervisory management and administrative staff is a major concern in Philadelphia, as well as many child welfare agencies across the country. Casey Family Programs, a leading national child welfare foundation, estimates that for the 15 years prior to the pandemic, child welfare turnover rates were between 20% and 40%. In the spring of 2022, the Community Umbrella Agencies, or CUAs, reported an average turnover rate of social work staff of approximately 45%. We recognize the urgency by which this high turnover rate must be addressed, as maintaining a stable workforce is key to our system meeting its mandates and achieving quality outcomes for children, youth, and families. In order to address this very serious issue, we have employed a multi-layer strategy, including increasing salaries, providing focused training and consultation, and developing peer mentoring programs. We know that this problem will not simply be solved with money alone, which is why we work to better educate and train our workforce so that our CUA and provider staff are well equipped to deal with the incredible challenges and stress of their job. We recognize, however, that increasing salaries to compensate for the hard and emotional work is necessary to decrease the turnover rate amongst child welfare staff. For this reason, 
the administration is requesting money in the FY24 budget to increase wages to our CUA and provider partners. Specifically, we are requesting a total of 2.5 million in general fund dollars, which will allow the city to, to draw down an additional $16.9 million in Commonwealth funds. This brings the planned investment in child welfare to an additional $19.4 million. The combination of general fund and Commonwealth support are detailed in the planned investments below. Our FY24 budget request includes additional funding to support a higher starting salary structure for seven existing COA positions and two new positions. This new funding will support significant salary increases for many COA staff, most notably caseworkers, increasing the average caseworker salary from 48,000 to 60,000 annually. These salary requests were reached after consultation and in partnership with COA leadership. We also requested funding for additional insurance increases, 600,000 per COA to support the rising cost of insurance. The salary increases described above and the increases to the insurance will result in an increase of $11 million across, across the COA contracts. In FY24, the department also requested an increase to the kinship and foster care rates by $6 per child per day. This includes a $2 increase per child per day to the provider for administrative costs and a $4 increase per child per day to the kinship and foster parents to care for the child or youth. This increase will result in $7.8 million across the provider contracts. It is important to note that our financial ask and commitment to raising salaries did not just begin for FY24. In fiscal year 2022, we supported a 3% increase to CUA salaries. This resulted in a $1.6 million increase across the CUA contracts. Additionally, CUAs were also permitted to utilize underspending to increase salaries above the original 3% increase. We also gave staff $1,000 incentive payments to support staff retention. In fiscal year 2023, we supported another 3% salary increase as well as additional funding to CUAs for increased insurance costs. These increases resulted in an increase of $3.5 million across the CUA contracts. The department also increased the kinship and foster care rates paid to providers by $2 per day per child, which resulted in an increase of $2.6 million across, across provider contracts. Throughout the year, we work with CUAs to evaluate the workforce performance metrics. CUAs receive ongoing consultation with DHS, meet biannually to review data and share best practices. This collaboration helps us to understand the causes and impact of turnover. It is also helps us to identify and implement strategies to mitigate turnover and improve retention. DHS collaborates with our contractor providers and with our state partners to develop strategies to support this work through ongoing partnership and extensive training. DHS University, the department's training and technical assistance division plays a critical role within our child welfare operations by providing the onboarding training to all CUBA new hires. Additionally, DHS University also provides technical assistance that supports the transfer of learning through case application and professional development to support the ongoing growth of knowledge and skills of DHS and CUBA staff. As I have shared many times with our provider partners, DHS is committed to collaboratively working alongside them to support our providers and retain, in retaining staff to improve the outcomes of the city's children and youth. My staff and I are happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you for your support and consideration. Thank you, Commissioner Ali, for your testimony. Um, and I wanted to see, are there any questions or comments from members of, the, of our committee? Or here today, uh, just to let you kn to know, Commissioner Ali is joined here today by several members of her staff um, who are available to also answer questions as well. Um, I'll start with a question, and I wanted to see if anyone else on City Council um, had any questions as well. But we can, we also could move on to our next panel after this if there's no questions. Um, the first question that I had. Uh, 
Councilman Thomas. Yeah, you know I talked to him all. Councilman Thomas. Okay, gotcha. All right, so, uh, so that's six hundred thousand dollars per year uh, for what assurance premiums. That's a start, um, but will it help an agency like Turning Points for Children, uh, which is facing a ten million dollar a year uh, premium um, in terms of support? So, uh, Council Member Phillips, thanks for that question. What I will say to you, um, just like all of our COAs, the state has been um, extremely generous in supporting the insurance costs for all of our providers. And so um, we have done that since the COAs um, started receiving cases back in FY12, and we will mm -hmm. continue to do so. Thank you. And then my next question, and I'm not sure if anyone else wants to jump in, and I'll 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 I'll, I'll yield after this. Uh, many child welfare workers have identified salary, as you noted, as the most fundamental factor, you know, driving the exodus of workers for the workforce. Simply put, the starting salaries for COA foster care workers is incredibly low. Um, so it's not competitive with some of the public sector, uh, such as social worker positions. Uh, with the Department of Human Services or similar positions with the school district in Philadelphia. So the salaries for these positions are even less competitive with other fields where social work positions exist, including our regional medical institutions such as Jefferson Health, Penn Medicine, um, CHOP, um, and Ameri Health. Uh, can you give me a sense of what a child welfare worker, child welfare worker uh, could expect to earn in a CUA within DHS and within a school district and within our regional medical institutions? So I can certainly speak um, to um, the CUAs as well as DHS. I'm unable to speak to the, the medical institutions, but I can tell you that as a social worker myself, um, and I've been a social worker for over 30 years, is that um, typically the um, salary for such a mission crit critical child welfare worker has always been below that of the medical professionals. However, we work to try to increase that. So to give you a sense, um, a DHS social worker salary um, ranges from $43,000 a year up until about $51,000 a year. That's the starting salary for trainees. If you look at a more experienced social worker, which is considered our social worker two, their salary mm -hmm. range is about 56,000 and it can go up to about $72,000 a year. The CUA case manager starting salaries are anywhere from about $48,000 a year to about $53,000 a year, which is comparable to our trainee social worker and our social worker one. Um, given our consultation with the CUA um, staff, we made the determination in our ass to increase the salary of CUA case managers to $60,000 a year in FY24, provided that we get the additional funding. Thank you. Council members, any questions for our DHS uh, commissioner? Before we go to our next panel. Thank you. All right. I. There, there being none, Rachel, will you please call the next panel on a resolution? Yes, the next panel is um, Samia Kim, David Fair, Frank Cervone, and Melissa Harvey in that order. All right, good afternoon. Excuse Are you connected and ready to proceed? Excuse me, Mr. Chairman. All right. All right. Hello. Yep. Uh, sure. I believe I believe Council Member uh, Johnson has joined. Oh, is that Council Member Johnson? Yes. Yes. I just want to be um, acknowledged with Mark Mark President before being in the hearing. Oh, Thank yes. You. Thank you. I want to acknowledge the Council Member President. Council Member Kenyatta Johnson is uh, present for the record. Thank you. Also, um, could you uh, please the first testifier if you can please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony good afternoon my name is samia kim um chairman phillips 
members of the City Council Children and Youth Committee, thank you so much for the opportunity to present testimony on the important topic of child welfare workforce in Philadelphia. Um, the Philadelphia Child Welfare Workforce Task Force is a collaboration of providers, community umbrella agencies, and advocates that convened last year to reevaluate re workforce related aspects of Philadelphia's child welfare system and identify opportunities for system improvements. I also want to recognize um, DHS and Commissioner Ali, who have been critical partners in the task force's work and leading achievements on behalf of the system. Um, the task force issued our report in November of 2022, a copy of, of which is available with our written testimony. Um, the task force really wanted to elevate the voices of our workers, and as a result, the reports and recommendations included therein were the direct result of a survey that included feedback from 281 child welfare workers in Philadelphia. Um, to give you an idea of what we mean when we say workforce crisis, when we surveyed our CUAs, we found an average turnover rate of about 45%. Um, so we took that and we, we reviewed other fields that are considered high turnover fields, sanitation, education, retail, and child care. And um, we, were, uh, we were not surprised but alarmed to find that the child welfare worker turnover rate was comparable to the child welfare, to the child care field and even retail. Um, on the other hand, um, we also were interested in finding out what's keeping some of our workers. So 68% of both foster care and COA workers cited that the top factor that kept them in this field was feeling like they make a difference and fits their personal life mission was also the third most popular answer at 53%. Um, so that tells us that despite minimal investment, despite minimal compensation, despite the challenges of working with extremely traumatized families and children, um, these individuals are here because they wanna make a difference in the trajectory of Philadelphia's future and Philadelphia's young people. Uh, these results also told us that these individuals remain in this, this field because of their own internal drive and altruism, but they also very strongly communicated that we're at a tipping point where the work is getting harder and the trend lines on salaries, compensation, workload, excessive documentation, they're all going in the wrong direction. The survey confirmed for us that salary was the primary factor driving the exodus of workers from this field. When asked for the top five factors that made workers consider leaving, over 80% cited inadequate pay. Um, what we mo found most alarming is that 44% of CUA and foster care provider respondents also reported having a second job to supplement their income. And even on top of that, for those that that opted not to have a second job, it wasn't because they were satisfied with their pay. Um, a lot of them indicated that um, they their work was too demanding and they just couldn't find the availability to support a second job. I want to be clear, though, that workers were not citing a need for increased salary out of personal gain. After surveying per provider agencies average salaries, the task force found that a foster care provider resource parent support worker earns almost $6,000 less than its CUA caseworker counterpart and even less than a Philadelphia DHS trainee position. COA case workers over time will also can also learn less, earn less than their Philadelphia DHS counterparts. Um, the salaries paid to these workers is relevant to the work of the city because the rates paid to providers to fund these positions are set by the DHS budget with approval from the state. Foster care agencies spend an average of 60% on their per diem going to employee compensation and um, we have, I think agencies have seen dramatic increases related to the cost of doing business. And although it's in, it's resulted in a multi-million dollar impact to the DHS overall system, the foster care per diem has only now seen its first increase of $2 in many years. The second most common reason child welfare workers cited for considering leaving the profession was high caseload and workload with a response rate of 45%. Workers reported high average COA caseloads as high as an agency-wide 18 families per worker for one COA and generally high levels across the system. So when we talk about a caseload, when an average Pennsylvania family consists of approximately 2.4 children, a single COA caseworker that's struggling with an 18 family caseload could also be supporting upwards of 43 children at any given time. What's more, the current DHS scoring tool lists over 40 items that our RPSW has to go through when visiting a family. When you're an overworked caseworker with dozens of children or families on your caseload, you can only imagine what running through a list of that many items during a visit will lead to. It doesn't mean that the resource parent is the one driving the conversation with the young person's needs. Instead, the worker is running through a checklist of questions to make sure they're meeting audit requirements. 
and DHS agreed. When we shared with them these findings, they agreed to look at areas in which the tool exceeds state or city requirements and let workers do the social work that they were trained to do. Um, the Philadelphia DHS per diem, though, should also be inclusive of strategies to alleviate challenges that overburden workers when we're in crisis positions. We, um, our paper refers to a bullpen of caseworkers to be readily available when workforce challenges or an increase of cases inevitably arise. Um, we also ask for a better caseload onboarding ratio so that when a newly hired worker comes in, they're not completely inundated with a full caseload, but has the ability to transition to a full caseload over time. An overnight shift is critical because agencies are required to sustain 24 hour coverage. Over the last couple of months, agencies have reported increased cases coming in at overnight hours. And while DHS has two shifts covering the full 24 hour coverage, our providers do not currently have the same. Overall, these per diems should be reviewed and adjusted on an annual basis. Every day we hear news of a new product shortage and all of us know that our own bills are not what they were one year ago. The same goes for these provider agencies. Similarly, throughout the year, there should be a clear and defined process for agencies to request additional funding when significant and unanticipated needs occur. The report outlines a number of priorities that we have asked DHS and other partners to consider to help us stabilize our workforce. Under the leadership of Commissioner Ali, DHS has made a commitment to many of the strategies that we've proposed. The task force plans to continue to meet on an ongoing basis to evaluate how and whether the reforms we're advocating for have been put in place, and if so, what their impact has been on our systems workers. When DHS talks about increased kinship homes, the need to improve the pool of resource homes, the ongoing and consistent improvements of KUAs through their scorecards, it feels almost impossible that the field did all of this with a 45% turnover rate. But they did, and they've remained com committed throughout this time. Imagine the impact that these agencies and workers could have made if they were fully funded to be fully staffed. We believe that City Council holds an important role in elevating the narrative of our workers and families as well as providing overall accountability for the system. As we continue our work, we ask that you would look at the initiatives that are happening through the child welfare system through this lens of an incredible workforce crisis. We appreciate the opportunity to present testimony and thank you for prioritizing the needs of our young people and the individuals who make great sacrifices by supporting their needs. Thank you, Samia. And I, and I just wanna uh, quickly note before we get to the, the next person, um is one of the things that did stand out to me in the report um uh, and recommendation was around you all have you know some random or sometimes you know plant you know funding support that you need every year and i didn't we didn't recognize that there was a, a lack of a process to request additional resources or funding um you know funded it from dhs and i'm hoping um that our commissioners here today um you know we can figure out <clears throat> what how we get that going and so forth but one of the things that i'm hoping that what i what i would like to see done is that these numbers that we you know hearing from you all and also the commissioner they line up well so during budget season we can as as council members as you mentioned we can um you can hold us accountable uh to working with you all on this because at the end of the day our children are at stake and if they're if our workers are tired then that's a problem that's not gonna help our kids so uh, all right i'm gonna say all right the next one the next person is uh david fair good afternoon thank you very much for the opportunity to speak with you today my name is David Fair, and I am the Deputy Chief Executive Officer of Turning Points for Children. Turning Points currently operates the largest community umbrella agency and foster care programs in the Philadelphia area, serving almost 3,000 children daily. And primarily as a result of the inadequate funding we receive, we have experienced significant staffing challenges in both programs in recent years. We have and will hear of the details and numbers which show the crisis in child welfare that chronic underfunding has wrought for both DHS and for its providers. But what you might not hear is hear of is the extraordinary stress and trauma related to the provision of child welfare services and of the toll such stressors take on those remarkable people who choose to do this work every day. 
Turning Points is honored to employ over 600 of these amazing people who go to incredible lengths every minute and every hour to reach our overarching goals, that every child be safe and that every child be with their family whenever possible. I have been honored to serve on the Philadelphia Child Welfare Workforce Task Force and to have been part of developing the urgent report and recommendations that you have before you. I will leave to others at this hearing to provide the details, but the report makes clear what anyone in child welfare has known for a very long time, that our lack of support for those on the front lines of caring for our most at-risk children feeds child abuse and neglect rather than reducing it. To be clear, by failing to pay a living wage to child welfare workers at all levels, by overwhelming those workers with unnecessarily burdensome paperwork, which often drains them of their energy and often has little relationship to the safety and well being of the child, by thinking that it makes sense to assign caseloads of up to 30 or more children at one time, by creating a system that is destined to fail so many families. We as a community of caring Philadelphians simply are not doing the best we can for the children and families who come to us for help. As the largest community-based child welfare organization in the region, Turning Points therefore has both the largest child welfare workforce in the system outside of DHS and the biggest challenges to finding and retaining those workers. This is not because of lack of effort on the part of Turning Points or its funders at state and city DHS. Earlier in this hearing, Commissioner Ali detailed the extraordinary efforts that DHS is making for fiscal year 2024 to improve compensation for child welfare workers. That is very important progress, but it is not enough. The bottom line is that we as a community, as represented on the council and the legislatures in the state and national levels, have been unwilling to make the necessary investment of energy and dollars that is required to reduce child abuse and neglect in our communities. This is not about funding for agencies. I say it again, we the people of Philadelphia and Pennsylvania have been unwilling to spend what it takes to keep our children safe. That failure is what leads to a 45% staff turnover rate in our system, significantly higher than is experienced in other public and private systems. It's what leads to 60 and 70 hour work weeks because we are unwilling to pay for on call and overnight workers to respond to the 24 seven nature of child welfare crises. It's what creates extraordinarily high caseloads, which results in lower quality work for more and more children and families every day. It even undermines the ability of child welfare workers to care for their own children as the urgencies of constant crises often prevent them from being there for their own families when needed. There is a simple solution, pay a living wage. Provide the kind of training and technology that supports good social work rather than just good paperwork. Stop star starving city agencies such as DHS of the funds they need to support systems of care that actually work and, and which by actually working ultimately reduce the costs for city taxpayers. I'd be happy to work directly with members of this committee to explore in more detail the specific challenges that our providers face. Working with at-risk children and families can be incredibly affirming and inspiring work, but it should be no surprise that that commitment and inspiration is worn down by poor working conditions and even poorer compensation. The challenges facing children, families, and workers involved in child welfare, as detailed in the workforce report, are in many ways complex, but in some ways they are simple to understand. If we invest in the safety and security of our children and in the livelihoods of the courageous heroes who go out every day to assure that safety and security, more children will thrive, more families will remain whole, more communities will be safer. If we don't, we are turning our backs on those children, on those families, and on their, those workers. And that begs the question, do we really care? Thank you for your attention. 
Thank you. Thank you, David, for your testimony. And, and this is actually uh, what you said about this investment not being enough and how we how important it is for us to have not only city support, but state and state uh, support is a really important. Um, I don't think people really understand the depth of what goes on with our with our workers and and social workers with children. I mean, but I'm gonna stop right there. I'm gonna hold my comments. Uh, we're gonna go over to to Frank um, Savone. Thank you, attorney. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm Frank Cervone, Executive Director of the Support Center for Child Advocates. Child Advocates is Philadelphia's pro bono lawyer program for abused and neglected children. We offer the skills and dedication of lawyer social worker teams to represent a thousand or more children each year. And we train 5,000 plus child serving professionals in live, virtual and online curricula. For more than 45 years, we have served as a resource to this community and to this council and I thank you for the invitation to serve in this role once again. I've been honored to serve with Regan Kelly, the CEO of Northeast Treatment Centers, as co-chair of the Workforce Crisis Task Force of the Pennsylvania Council of Children, Fam Youth and Family Services. I acknowledge the outstanding service of my colleague, Samia Kim, uh, whom you've heard uh, moments ago, and my own colleague, Child Advocate Social Worker, Lauren McNeil, here at Child Advocates. This is a crisis that is years in the making. Workforce problems have been documented in the DHS CUA scorecard since the be very beginning of the reform initiative, Improving Outcomes for Children, or IOC, 10 years ago. It's just about always the lowest scoring field in the five bells scoring rubric of the scorecard, with agencies receiving, often receiving just one or two bells that is, quote, unsatisfactory or even critical. DHS's 2021 foster care report shows that more than one third of the provider agencies, quote, needed improvement. <clears throat> Pardon me. Unfortunately, the needs of this workforce, the child welfare workforce, have been ignored for just as long. Importantly, we should not be criticizing uh, and uh, as you may hear in, in the marketplace, we shouldn't be criticizing the CUA and provider agents for these deficits as if it's a management problem. I hope you can see it in the very presentation of this study as being from providers and advocates that we share these concerns. These are structural deficits related to compensation, funding formulas and limitations, commitment to outcomes, and a need for new solutions to old problems. As Commissioner Ali cited, the National Foundation Casey Family Programs notes the phenomenon. When families come in contact with the child welfare system, nothing has the power to impact them more than the professionals who serve them. Maintaining a high performing, engaged and committed workforce is vital to improving, to providing families with the quality supports they need to stabilize, reunify and thrive. Research and practice wisdom suggests that positive child welfare outcomes depend largely on the capacity and competence of the child welfare workforce. However, recruitment, hiring, and retention of dedicated staff remain persistent challenges for child protection agencies across the country. For the past 15 years, child welfare turnover rates have been estimated between 20 and 40%. So what does unsatisfactory and needs improvement and critical look like? In our cases at Child Advocates, we are seeing tremendous levels of staff vacancy and turnover among case managers like CUA workers, foster care, and resource parent social workers, therapists. Just about everywhere, a professional has some contact point with a child or a family. A child might have three or more persons in the same role over their time in care with weeks or months of no worker assigned or quote, supervisor covering. These gaps result in loss of case history, of referrals, of loss of continuity of care and a host of other problems. Case history means what happened to me? How am I doing? Where's this going? Both the positive advances and the negative slides get missed or get lost when there's a gap in staffing. 
like a child healing in her trauma treatment, or perhaps waiting months for sessions to start, or a parent participating in visits or not showing up. Children cannot know who is, come, who is coming to pick them up at school or visit with them to hear how they're doing or share with them what happened to them. Their doctor's visits go unscheduled, their hearings get continued, their adoptions get delayed. Delays are not measured in hours or days, but in weeks and months and years. Their lives are put on hold, which means, of course, that their development is interrupted and stymied. This is dangerous. Its impact is lasting. This is the face of the child welfare workforce crisis in Philadelphia. Our own office staffs cases with child advocate social workers, master's level social workers, teamed with volunteer attorneys and staff attorneys. But we are having to do the job that others are supposed to be doing, and that contributes all sorts of problems. Case managers and other workers are supposed to set up medical exams and psychological evaluations. My colleague child advocate social workers are making those appointments because someone else is not doing so. Our bilingual staff are doing translations for caregiver visits and service planning meetings because there are so few bilingual case managers and providers. We all know what this looks like. When you have to do someone else's job on top of your own, tasks do not get done, quality is compromised, and clients suffer. And it's a crisis that everyone in our work knows about. The pattern has been studied for more than a decade, like similar patterns among teachers, childcare workers, therapists, prison guards, and so many other fields. Scholars have highlighted deep challenges, including the 20th century version of one's own personal sense of mission and the community-wide need to affirm the role of child welfare and human services work. We get buffeted in our work every time there's a crisis in the news. COVID seems to have exploded the problem, but there's plenty of literature to demonstrate that this is a pre and a post COVID problem needing large and influential solutions. The impact on children and families is known too, and yet it continues. The crisis itself is harmful, even abusive. In one study, youth report painful feelings in response to the relationship loss when their workers leave too soon and a reluctance to trust and connect to others. In a similar study, researchers examined youth voices and outcomes and found that turnover had a direct impact in three main domains, loss of trust, instability, and having second chances. Turnover in the workforce not only leads to financial hardship for agencies, as you've heard so eloquently from my colleagues, as they work to replace exiting caseworkers, it also directly impacts children, youth, and families. What are the solutions? First, study these problems in the open, just as you're doing today. Make them part of the dialogue of reform, of real change, and meaningful accountability. Philadelphia DHS should be commended for its continued transparency of data and performance with the SCUA Cork, with the CUA, with the SCUA with the CUA scorecard, say that three times fast, and other reports. But that transparency only works if it leads to identifying strengths and weaknesses, and then real change in the right direction. These include numbers and timing of uncovered cases, CUA and provider staff turnover, waiting lists, delays in treatment, placement, and family permanency. You ought to know that data. We ought to be talking about it. What gets studied gets improved. We all have to call out the crisis and what it means in the lived experience of children, families, and workers. Second, we commend Commissioner Alley's budget requests. Salaries of the private provider workforce need to improve, in some cases, dramatically. When identifying per diem rates, Philadelphia DHS should calculate and advocate for one that is inclusive of a living competitive salary. Third, they need to create mechanisms for additional funding resources when significant and pressing needs occur. Fourth, they need to create a funding uh, mechanism for a bullpen of caseworkers to be readily available so that we don't have six weeks of waiting with a case uncovered when we know that people are leaving. 
Lastly, the improved condition and stability of child welfare and human services workers must be high priorities for the new administrations of Governor Shapiro, of the new city of Philadelphia mayor, and for current budget deliberations by this council. In the end, I call your attention to the title of one of the articles I cited in my written remarks. It reveals a kind of a measure. Quote, if you can't be with this client for some years, don't do it. If you're not committed to stay with this work, don't even come. Now that's a pretty high bar, but that's what we should be striving for. Our workforce colleagues are often with a child or a family for just months and rarely for the full time of their service. We need to create the conditions that will allow and encourage staff to be with their clients for all the years that their clients need them. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Frank, for your testimony. Uh, and I would like to now turn it over to Melissa Harvey and then council members be ready for questions and comments thereafter. Good afternoon, Chairman Phillips and members of the Philadelphia City Council Children and Youth Committee. Thank you for the opportunity for me to speak with you today about our foster care program. My name is Melissa Harvey and I'm the Vice President of Community-Based Programs at Gemma Services. Gemma Services provides vital behavioral health, special education, child welfare, and prevention services for more than 4,000 youth and families each year. At GEMMA Services, we believe every child deserves the safety and security associated with residing in a nurturing, stable home environment. Every day, I am amazed by the dedication from our staff and foster parents who help our kids in so many ways. I am truly humbled by their passion and commitment to our youth and families. What we're experiencing here is a workforce crisis in the child welfare system at record rates that is directly impacting a child's right to safety. This workforce crisis significantly stresses and impacts a system that is already fragile that many of my other colleagues spoke about here today and has been for many years. And without a stable workforce, our most vulnerable children are at risk. For example, when a CUA case manager leaves, we as a foster care agency then directly experience that domino effect of that impact. And Frank shared about this too. The child's history, the next steps of their case, they get lost. A follow-up on medication may get missed. A medical appointment that needed to be rescheduled falls through the cracks. We then receive phone calls from our foster parents inquiring about where things stand. Our foster parents may say to us that they're trying to get in touch with their CUA worker, but they can't because the old caseworker left and now someone else is trying to cover the case and we don't know who that is. Our amazing staff are often trying to fill in those gaps, even when we are short staffed too. And I wanna be clear, this, this isn't about casting blame on CUA or any one entity. This is about how these workforce stressors are impacting our entire child welfare system because this doesn't happen in a vacuum. As a result, child safety is at risk of being compromised and is already being compromised. And we can start by addressing this problem with a well-funded system. Inadequate daily rates for foster care are directly linked to inadequate payments to our foster parents and to our employees. So I ask that we join together in our commitment to the safety and security of our foster children by taking immediate steps of increasing the daily rate to our foster care providers. Our children deserve to be safe and our staff deserve to receive a de decent living wage to do this incredibly challenging work. So we must invest in this issue and make an immediate call to action. Thank you. I would like to thank David Fair, Frank Savone, as well as Melissa Harvey and Kim, uh, Samia Kim for their uh, testimony today. I hope for our viewing public this was informative and for some um, this was also a resolve that of something that you already knew and now you want our city council members as well as other leaders in the city and state uh, to really uh, get 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 a hold of this right and take and take some sort of action. So I'm hoping that this was something that was uh, you know energizing for all of us. Um, I would like to begin 
with questions and comments from other city council members um, before I have any questions or comments. All right. Is that Councilman Harity trying to get us started? Yeah, I'd just like to know what what the average uh, salary for social workers are nationwide. Does anybody know? Are we close or are we nowhere near it? So I can talk about that a little bit. We studied it. Um, as a as a task force, and this is Samia uh, Kim from uh, the Child Welfare Workforce Task Force. So when we talked about provider average salaries across the Philadelphia system, those agencies that contract with Philadelphia, we found that what we call their resource parent support worker rate um, average salary, which is like the essential equivalent of their caseworker position, was about $40,000, which you can imagine is um, not going to get you very far in this economy. Um, we also compared that to a couple of different statistics. So in the Bureau of Labor Statistics, they estimated the mean wage of medical social workers because that was what was available um, in the Philadelphia Camden Wilmington region to be around $64,820. We also looked at um, that sort of sparked us to look at other Philadelphia region social worker employees or employers. So um, Commissioner or Councilman Phillips and Commissioner Ali uh, referenced some of the um, various medical institutions in this area. When we did just a basic sort of like internet indeed type of comparison, we found that um, Jefferson Health, the annual average salary of a medical social worker was around 62,000, Penn Medicine around 63,000. Uh, we looked at CHOP, which was in the 70s, and um, AmeriHealth was around 60,000. And we even looked at um, comparable social work positions in the school district, which you know is another area where we talk a lot about recruitment and retention challenges. And their, um, their social workers with a bachelor's degree will begin earning $50,000. So that's a minimum of $10,000 more than the social workers in the social work field. Um, there, they have these sort of annual increases on an ongoing basis. And um, one thing I want to note is that when the Philadelphia uh, foster care rate doesn't increase, providers are unable to also offer um, cost of living adjustments for their own employees. So many of them have sort of been working under their own entry level salary for um, close to a decade, just sort of unable to increase salaries because there is no increase in a rate that's available for their funding. Yeah. Yeah, so thank you. Uh, you know, it's it's just very frustrating uh, to see how undervalued our social workers are when uh, we we have a real crisis here in the city of Philadelphia. Um, you know, if they say in, in order a single person with a child would have to make at least $38 an hour to be able to afford to live in the city of Philadelphia. And yet we mandate our employees live in the city of Philadelphia, but we're not paying them a wage to live in the city of Philadelphia. And, and that really irritates me. So thank you. Yeah, I agree. Councilwoman Brooks. Yeah, this is a kind of a follow up. So just for clarity, you said regardless of the qualifications that some of them hit a wall and there's no room to grow because we don't fund high enough. So if we had a entry level social worker coming in, um, what? how much is the max out at that particular at, at entry level social worker for these agencies? Um, I'm not sure. Can you can you clarify what you mean about um, like a max out or um, what's the top so, salary? Like what's the the maximum amount of money you could make as a social worker at these at the agencies currently? I see. Um. So we what we did was when we looked at that forty thousand number, that was sort of the average of um of foster care providers across the system. Um. They as private agencies, they they sort of set their own salary rates. 
I know that for the community umbrella agencies, they have specified salary um, ranges that are universal for all COAs, regardless of whether you're a COA from turning points or whether you're a COA from net. Um, I don't have that number immediately in front of me. And David, I don't know if you happen to know that. So it's no okay. uniform rate across agencies, even though they're being funded through um, our child welfare system? So the, the rate is uniform. Um, the rate that they're paid is uniform across specialized behavioral health foster care providers and general foster care providers. Um, but the way that it's distributed has varied because ve different agencies have different expenses. What we have found is that foster care agencies in general spend an average of 59% on their compensation, but because they might have different expenses related to their utilities, their rent, their um, ins liability insurance, all of that sort of um, can vary and um, isn't, isn't applied uniformly. I think it's consistent with DHS positions because of the way that sort of the DHS budget is created, but with each individual provider agency, the salary varies because they're all sort of private entities in and of themselves. Are we requiring master's degrees for these programs? For some of them, master's degrees are required for like supervisor positions, um, but not for uh, caseworker or entry level positions. It, 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 Councilwoman Brooks just asked a great question because part of the testimony was was removing educational limit requirements, like education requirements, in order to create, as as uh, you know, Attorney Savone mentioned, uh, like a bullpen of caseworkers, social workers. Um, what are the limit? What are the education requirements that are prohibiting you know us from getting the workers that we need? That could be anyone, I guess, who wants to take, take that question. I can I can answer that. Um, I don't I don't believe I don't see on my side an education requirement that would limit um, the hiring of social workers because it is a profession. Social workers, so whether you're talking about a resource parent, social worker, a DHS social worker, or a CUA case manager, they all have to have a bachelor's degree in social work or related field. So that related field can be criminal justice, that related field can be psychology. There's a whole list of related fields. When you okay. talk about a supervisor level, whether you are a supervisor at a provider, at ACUA or at DHS, then the supervisors have a master's degree in social work or a related field. Thank you. Thank you for that clarification. Uh, I was also a, a commissioner. I was also uh, really stunned to learn about the bi bilingual provider um, lack of support for our children. Um, is it is it is it funding with them as well? Um, at, or is it just hard to find bilingual workers um, in this particular field or is it a combination of both? So it probably is a combination of, of both. Um, however, when you don't have a bilingual, you know, social worker or supervisor, we certainly use um, Globo. And so we use language access. Um, so um, it depends on the recruitment strategy, but also depends on the particular provider agency. Yeah. I I am I am 100% with this idea of increasing salaries um, only because I do recognize what age of of what generation that we're in right there there's so many employment opportunities and if and if the if, if they would if if the, what they would say the bag is not there um, ultimately eat, they don't sometimes follow their heart but then people who do follow their heart right and get into this profession they're excited about it but then because they're struggling at home um they're and then the work is just so overwhelming in itself they're like i just can't do this no more as much as i love the mission and the work is because not it's, it's taking a toll on my myself right because i personally don't have the funds and then not only that is mental um it, you know mentally draining for them and so i i get it and that's why i think the the funding for salary increases will help us well, number one find better workers 
um, and also make sure we increase the number of workers. Um, and so what I'm more interested in seeing is if um, I'm hoping that commissioner from this conversation, we can get together with all of the cool representatives today and really come up with the best line item that the city can produce, um, you know, for for this particular increase in salaries and hope that we will see an increase of of workers, um, you know, for the for this because our children need it. Now, here's the other thing. All our workers, are they receiving free um, mental health support? Um, you know, for for them, like, is that is that part of the package? Because Lord, do they need it too? So I would say I can uh, speak certainly to the Department of Human Services because because each provider um, gives us a line item in terms of support. So for um, DHS social workers and CUA case managers, we use a provider car, called RS Counseling and Wellness in mm -hmm. order to address the vicarious trauma that is experienced by social workers, because this is difficult and challenging work, um, working in this field. So we do offer, they either do group, um, and so sometimes units take advantage of that, particular um, social work units, or they also provide individual um, as well. But I would imagine um, that some providers may have something similar. If not, then certainly through their healthcare um, packages. Thank you. Turn it back over to Council. Council Warren Brooks, do you have a question or comment? Oh. I did. So you kind of led into one of my questions about oh, what kind darn. of supports are <laughs> for the stress and mental health related to the job. And yeah. what's that was my question. And I do have another question about um, the paperwork. Can uh, someone talk more about the burdensome paperwork and how what we can do to address that with the job mm. as well? Great question. Great question. So I do think that um, paperwork is uh, an issue that really requires a lot of balance, right? Because when we also surveyed our social workers, over 80% of them expressed that like, yes, the documentation is excessive. It really takes a toll on our ability to engage children and families. It's not in direct proportion to our work with our families. But do we recognize that documentation is important? Absolutely. I think caseworkers will really attest to the importance of documentation and what it means for their families, especially in a time of workforce turnover um, where there may be another caseworker coming along and picking up this, this family along the way. Um, with that being said, though, I do want to recognize that the commissioner has made a commitment to trying to minimize documentation requirements where safety is not compromised. So looking at where we're at city and state um, sort of baseline requirements, I think the challenge with our previous documentation requirements is that there were requirements that far exceeded what agencies were were looking at when they were looking at state licensing and requirements and sort of like city contractual obligations. Um, so the, the real difficulty there is sort of running through all of these documentation requirements and then also trying to to hear from the youth and the 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 family about what their um, what their needs are. Thank you, thank you so much for that, Councilman Phillips. I'm I'm done. That concludes sure. my questions. No, we 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 have the air for the questions. So I'm happy we're we're asking because it's important that we get this right. Um, there are so many issues in the city of Philadelphia that we need to address, and this is a vital one only because the our social workers are working closely with the children that are going to need the support so they can be successful in school as well as their careers and also this is also really critical to our public safety issue um, in the city of Philadelphia um, and so I, I totally get it I mean as a former educator um, I, I it was a lot of work there but this social work thing is on another another level <laughs> so um, so I, I, I get it and that's why this is uh, important for me. I do want to ask this and I'll I'll stop here uh, and if there's any other this to see if there's any other questions, but um, I am I'm very I'm very curious about how do we how do we make sure that we we do once we if this funding is approved and we find the money to 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 
uh, to increase the so increase the funds for um, well increase the salaries of our social workers and so forth uh, commissioner as well as you know others who are on this panel uh, we ensure that there's a plan to make sure that we are getting the getting the social workers in place like do as as Frank mentioned we don't have a bullpen yet right <laughs> I mean so we're gonna have to be very have we thought about what our plan is to recruit um, and where we're going to recruit at and if we don't have a plan what is it you know what can we you know when can we expect a plan So I can actually start in terms of the plan around recruitment and we work with, you know, um, our core providers in particular around their recruitment strategies. And so the first thing, which is extremely important that we talked about today is really around increasing the salaries and also paying incentives for the social work staff. The other thing in terms of recruitment is ensuring that um, DHS have MOUs with at least five uh, major universities. Um, we also encourage internships um, for our COAs and provider staff as well. So we need to get further upstream, you know, in order to um, make child protective services and child welfare attractive to um, individuals coming out of college. I would also say um, also offering, um, we used to do internships as well for um, young people in high school that needed to do their senior projects. And so we have done some outreach to high schools as well so that um, individuals, high schoolers who want to do their senior projects, they can certainly shadow, you know, DHS employees as well. Love that. And, and I think the final thing um, that we also do is that we know that we have some experienced social workers at DHS, at the COAs and the providers, and make sure that we're mentoring new um new hires because this work is difficult. So how do you get the work-life balance? That's extremely important. Yeah, and this is great. And, and let me also follow up with this. The FY24 budget is a great start, but I wanna ask what needs to be step two and three and four as well? The other step um, that we also spoke to, I think Samia spoke to that, is really around looking at the, uh, the workload issue versus the caseload issue mm, in terms yes. of what are the CUA responsibilities, what are the responsibilities to our provider staff to determine, again, is the city exceeding expectations? And if so, and requirements of the city, of the state and federal government, then we're, we are willing to take a second look at that as long as it doesn't compromise the safety and the well-being of young people. We have done that in the past, mm -hmm. um, working alongside um, the CUA case managers and the CUA leadership, so we can certainly do that again. We have also um, currently doing that with our supervised independent living providers, and we'll continue to do that with other providers because the needs of the providers and the expectations are a little different, and so you're talking about a series of smaller work groups in order to get ahead of this issue of workload. Thank you. And oh, this is okay. The other, the last question I had, and was is around now the David Fair. I think Turning Points is no longer going to be a cool model. What's next for Turning Points at this point? So, um, oh, so I should let you answer that, David. Go ahead, David. Um, Turning Points has been around for 187 years, and we have other programs besides the COAs that we hope to invest, again, mostly with DHS dollars in uh, parenting education programs or foster care program. Um, we have a, a program that's called Family Finding, which helps find kin and other relatives, I mean, other people important in the lives of children so that they don't have to end up in foster care or in foster care with a stranger. Um, we have a uh, emphasis lately on older youth. We're doing some work with the DA's office as well as with DHS around helping the many youth who age out of the foster care system who are unstable and need to continue to be supported even after they are no longer of the age to be able to stay in the DHS system. So we expect to be a vibrant uh, participant in the child welfare landscape. We yes. wish we could we wish we could continue to do that through the community umbrella agencies, but it's just impractical for us to do that at this stage. 
Yeah, and and so and just for the record, everyone, uh, re we have a viewing public here. Just school us again, community umbrella agencies that are in partnership with DHS. Just in case anyone didn't know, uh, Commissioner Ali, what's going to happen to their cases? Uh, uh, who's taking them over? Who's going to manage your cases and what's going to happen to those children? Yeah, so we actually have um, a request for a proposal that we are currently reviewing. And so we did um, post uh, for a request for a proposal um, a few months ago. And so we are in the review process as we speak. The review process not only consists of reviewing the proposal, but also a presentation done by the potential applicants as well as site visits. Um, a part of the proposal included for the um, new applicant to uh, take on the workforce of Turning Points for Children. Mm -hmm. And so um, those work plans have been submitted by all of the applicants. Turning Points for Children um, will continue to provide transition support to the new providers up until December of 2023. Thank you. And I promise this is my final comment and question. Uh, recently, I've also heard a recommendation around uh, the following that perhaps the best solution, and this is something that's really important as we go into budget hearings and also this can be countered by other council members, and I think it's important to have this discussed by all of you, the best solution is to not have COAS altogether and just go back to focusing on having DHS deal with all of the, you know, funding DHS to deal with all the cases in general. Why is that not, is that a good practice? Or why is that not a good practice? What what needs to be said about that? Yeah, thanks for that question, Councilmember Phillips. Um, and my answer to that is um, the reason why we move to improving outcomes for children and the CUA case management um, model is because we did not have good, we meaning DHS did not have good outcomes for children and youth. Um, and so back in 2010, we went through a whole process in terms of engaging providers, engaging um, the community, engaging families, um, also engaging child welfare foundations to determine what is the best model for our child protective services um, department. And we believe because we do our best work, meaning DHS, doing um, investigations, managing the hotline, is that we wanted to ensure that there was one um, provider or one case manager working with the families. Because at that particular time, before improving outcomes for children, families had both a DHS social worker as well as a provider social worker that was going out to their home, which was causing a great deal of confusion for, um, for families. And so after a few years of um, research and engagement, we decided to move to a single case management system, hence improving outcomes for children. And so we believe that that is the right model. Um, yes, we do have challenges in terms of the child welfare um, workforce. However, we have seen some tremendous gains when you talk about the outcomes for children and families, some of which I referenced in my testimony earlier. Thank you, thank you. Uh, will the new CUA face a $10 million premium insurance? It depends. So I, I would say I would not know that, um, Council Member Phillips. The new provider agency will certainly um, be responsible for getting their own insurance. I do want to state that oftentimes the insurance premiums increase as a result of claims. And so this uh, will possibly be a new provider. Certainly they wouldn't have the claims that were associated by attorney points for children, but I would not be able to speak to whether or not they would have a $10 million um, insurance premium or not. All right. I think it's important, Councilman, to remember that Turning Points had four COAs, not just one COA. And I think we've learned something about the size of a COA and, where, and how that impacts things like overhead costs and insurance. And I think we simply were too large to be able to get a reasonable insurance uh, coverage. Yeah, no, that's good. That's, I mean, it, Every time I think of it's done, I always think of some some other things, but I'm really going to wrap it up now. Uh, but I, one of the things I just I am curious about is it true that we have two that sometimes families have two social workers on one student, 
as opposed to one social worker. Would that be helpful if we just go back to getting, we do the salary increase and we get one social worker on one on one particular student and family? Well, the, the IOC was supposed to reduce fragmentation of service. So there were there was too much fragmentation. And going back is is really just an illusory idea. There there really okay. is no there's just no going back to the old way. And it wasn't like there were those were great old days. Right? Okay. Uh, just like you know the classic, there weren't really good old days. Um, what we have not seen is, in a sense, we haven't seen the promise of IOC realized either in terms of improving outcomes or in terms of reduced fragmentation. Mm -hmm. um, the, if you if you were to study the chart on the, uh, the the chart of assigned staff on a particular case for a particular child for a particular family, sometimes you'll see eight or ten professionals on the page. Right. It's an extraordinary and complicated array. That's that's really problematic. Now, part of that came with, um, uh, in a sense, it feels like a necessary part of a privatized model. Um, you know, you, you let it out to the marketplace. And so Commissioner Ali and her colleagues will solicit proposals for this service, solicit proposals for that service. Samia's colleagues are going to come forward with a variety of proposals. There are dozens of providers in the world. We like that in one sense, but without testing it against, in a sense, a standard of, uh, in a sense, a numerical standard, how many professionals do you think it's reasonable for the average family to engage? There's no data on that right now. There ought to be. We ought to be able to see very clearly what you'd see. You'd be shocked because we see in over and over and over again, you know, sometimes a dozen or more providers engaging a family. It's daunting. Wow. So that's well, in a way that I call that IOC version two, right? The next generation of IOC has to fix that fragmentation issue. It was supposed to fix it uh, and it hasn't yet. In a way, it's gotten worse. In a, in a numerical sense. That's unfortunate. I, 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 and and we, we certainly have to come up with uh, some resolution around it. I want to say thank you to the viewing public. Are there any questions or comments before we close out? OK, so. I just want to say that thank you. I want to just say thank you. This conversation is long overdue. And so I'm happy that we're having it. And I want to thank the task force for coming to me and enlightening us on this and encouraging us uh, to talk about this. I want to thank our, uh, oh, Councilwoman Brooks, did you have anything that you want to add? Okay. I want to thank Councilwoman Brooks. I want to thank Councilman Thomas. I want to thank Councilman Johnson and Councilman Gautier, Councilman Harity, um, for all joining us today and all of you in the viewing public, Rachel, thanks for helping to put us to put this together. Uh, thank you for listening and just know that we're not only listening, that we're gonna be working on something. That's why we called this hearing today uh, because our social workers are in need because our children are most importantly in need in the city of Philadelphia. Thank you. Uh, there being no, no one else here to testify on this resolution, this concludes the business of the Children and Youth Committee for today. This public hearing on resolution number 230037 is recessed to the call of the chair. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Philadelphia. We'll get to work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman.